So I'd like to welcome all of you here today, especially for braving the fog that's out there today. Um, we're pleased to have with us three distinguished speakers, and they're going to be presenting 10-minute talks, and that'll be followed by a question and answer period. Um, we're quite excited because atmospheric aerosols is a truly global issue, and if you'll look around the audience, you'll actually find that our audience members represent 15 different countries. So I think we're going to have a really rich, exciting discussion. So without further ado, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Mr. Enrique Hamilton. He is the president of the board of Pernatura Noreste, a non-governmental organization with a mission of conserving biodiversity through sustainable development. He wears many hats, businessman, conservationist, writer, and photographer. Today he will be introducing and moderating today's workshop, as well as discussing his own work at the interse intersection of policymaking, politics, and conservation. So please join me in w welcoming Enrique Hamilton. Thank you, Sherry. Good morning. Buenos dias. Atmospheric aerosols are not new. For example, in 1883, suspended dust particles from the eruption of the Krakatoa volcano produced magnificent sunsets around the world. And in 1952, the Great London Smog killed more than 4,000 people and galvanized the, en the enactment of clean air laws. What is new is our rapidly growing and understanding of the diverse and wide-ranging effects of these particles on human health, biodiversity, and global climate. Cutting-edge research in this area spans the very small, the physical properties of individual particles and the ways they react chemically, to the very large, the movement of atmospheric aerosols around the globe. Three of today's panelists, actually two of today's panelists, will discuss current scientific research on atmospheric aerosols. Um, Dr. Mark Tiemens will describe how isotopes can be used to determine the origin of particulates and what his research around the world shows about their long-range transport. And I believe, Mark, you will also make uh, some comments about Dr. Prather's uh, papers as well. Um, Dr. Kimberly Prather, who is not present, uh, was, was going to explain how atmospheric aerosols can be detected and characterized in real time. So Mark will be wearing two hats this morning. And Dr. Mario Molina will emphasize the specific environmental problems being caused by aerosols on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. The findings and implications of his Mexico Megacities project and his planned study of the Imperial Valley area to our east. Science can tell us what is happening and what the effects will be but solutions depend on politics and policy making. I will discuss the historical and political perspectives of environmental protection, particularly in the light of population growth on both sides of our border. Atmospheric aerosols are a global problem, not a binational issue. However, lessons learned from the successes and failures to mitigate the effects of atmospheric aerosols in this region at the juxtaposition of a highly industrialized and developing nation can provide a useful model for global efforts. Dr. Mark Tiemens. My role now is uh, Dr. Prather is actually in the field analyzing aerosols and she won't be able to make it today but what I would like to use this talk for is to give you a little bit more detail about what Enrique just eloquently described about the importance of aerosol and secondly, to describe for you and show you how these measurements are made, which is, is a, a, a masterpiece of measurement uh, technology uh, that Dr. Prather and her group have, have done. One of the problems with aerosols is um, visibility, quite simply. Here you see a shot taken in the Indian Ocean of the Maldive Islands, what it looks like from an aircraft, and what the effect of aerosols does on on visibility. What are these? They're basically just solid and liquid particles that are suspended in the atmosphere. That includes smog, fog, bacteria, soot, sea spray, pollen, anything that's a particle in the atmosphere. They're very small. You can't see, you can't see them essentially. So the size we're talking about, uh, it says three nanometers to 100 microns. It's invisible to your eye in other words. The effects are huge. Human health, you'll see some details on this, cardiovascular disease, mortality, possibly cancer, 
and lost days in the workforce are a result of aerosol inhalation, visibility, and the effect on climate. Um, there's a number of ways it's made. The trick in this business, how are they made? Where are they transported? This is a global issue. It's the reason we're speaking with all of you. It's not a single country issue. It's hemispheric. So that's why we're interested in discussing these issues uh, collaboratively. This is a plot that shows trajectories. What you see on the left is that from India and China, the emissions reach the United States and, and parts south of the United States. But you also see on the right-hand side that the emissions from the eastern United States reach Central Europe in about a four-day time period. And having just returned from a conference in Vienna where there was a great discussion about the American influence on Central Europe, it's a hemispheric difference. Everyone is downstream of everyone. So it's not a single country issue, and it's important. These are the different sources. Combustion and transportation and fuel are the big issues. Sea salt, pollen are natural. Discriminating between these different sources is the name of the game and what's important and why the work that uh, Professor Prather does is particularly interesting. Human health, what this basically shows, and it's more to remind me to say it rather than to show it to you directly, the small particles that are made in combustion are just the right size that you inhale them and they stick in your lungs. After sticking in your lungs, they get into your bloodstream and they stay there. So this is a major issue, and it's why it's important for cardiovascular disease, uh, number one. But there's a number of intensive studies going on that show that these effects for human health could actually be much wider than just simply cardiovascular disease. Uh, and it shows here that it's the very fine particle ones that are the issue with getting into your lungs and, and cardio system. And, um, this is the large ones deposit everywhere, and they're less an issue than the small ones. Besides the cardiovascular climate change, having just returned for a conference where this was discussed, one of the most large uncertainties in trying to understand the climate now and in the future is what these particles do. So understanding what they're made of, where they come from, and how they change is critical. And that's what this slide is showing, is how it impacts with the warming and the cooling. So they can do both. They can make clouds and warm, or they can reflect light and cool. Complicated. And that's showing how the energy gets transmitted around the atmosphere and how these particles sticking in the atmosphere affect it. Traditionally, particles are collected and brought back in a huge group. And you don't know necessarily who's doing what over time. But the advantage of this technique is not having to collect these over long time periods and average, but rather collect one particle at a time and get some idea of what's inside of it. So the real information that's so important in doing this single particle analysis is being able to dissect one particle and understand what's in it. And from that, one can deduce where it came from and how it's made. This is some pictures of them, and you can see that they aren't spherical. They're everything. Uh, the center one, you can see some of the crystals that are made. You can see smoke particles, soot particle from burning, uh, tar balls from burning of biomass, corn fields. And biomass burning globally is a huge issue, and especially in Central and South America. This is a picture of the machine. I'm not going to give a chemistry lecture here. I'd be happy to, but I won't, from a chemist. And physicists, it's a masterpiece. This has been deployed all around the world. This is one that was deployed, the instrument was deployed in the Indian Ocean to understand in the Indian Ocean experiment what's coming out, how is the climate of the Indian Ocean affected. What's the impact of transportation? Not only in San Diego, but anywhere. This is a huge issue, especially in large cities. Uh, that includes Los Angeles, Mexico City, Madras, Calcutta, anywhere where there's a lot of transportation. The issue of freeways is important. And what happens over time in those regions is critical. And that's a real advantage of Professor P Prather's technique, is being able to understand, using in this case San Diego as a model last year. Um, in terms of trying to develop a decision in a big city, and I think 
perhaps Professor Molina will talk about this because he's much more an expert at this than I am. How much comes from cars, trucks, diesels, non-diesels is very important. It's very important for decision making in any city and any country. And using this technique, you can fingerprint the air in a different region, which ultimately allows sensible decisions to be made in an area. The newest generation of this is what all of us strive for, is being able to fly your instrument, to follow the air masses in real time. And this is showing uh, the next generation of Professor Prather's machine that will be able to be flown and samples taken to follow the air masses. And unmanned vehicles, the UAVs, as, if you will, shown here on the right, are the ultimate goal because these can be flown over long distances and multiple numbers deployed so that you can really understand an area and what's happening. And that was uh, Professor Kimberly Prather's group and the research they're doing in single particle analysis. Thank you. That was my substitute talk for Professor Prather. And now I'd like to introduce myself. I'm not going to tell you any chemistry. And uh, Enrique just told you the level that I think is important is I use isotopes as a fingerprint. They change depending on what happens in a process. And if you understand the quantum chemistry of how that works, you can understand something about the process. So my world is fingerprinting. And that's all the chemistry. Now I want to tell you what we study. And I always give this talk the same way because I like to tell you what my goal is. And my goal, like uh, many of us in the field, is to understand this. And we think of this in terms of a planet, not a country, and not a city. And the idea is simple. If you understand the planet, you can understand a region. If you want to understand, for example, San Diego, Tijuana, if you can understand the planet and the level at which things happen at that level, then you have a much better opportunity to understand a region. You have to study the region also. But if you understand the global issue as well, your level of information is better, and your ability to make decisions eventually um, in terms of policy is increased. And that's the goal in a very simple sense. So we try to understand these connections. They occur across the planet. It's not local. Um, it oftentimes is hemispheric. And so we try to understand these connections so that we can understand what the consequences are. Turns out in this world that we live in and how to understand these things, it's very strange. So if you want to understand what happens at the ground, a lot of what determines it happens actually above the ground. The problem with happening above the ground is that it's above the ground. And it's far enough above the ground that you can't get there easy. So my experiments sometimes are difficult. Here's my experiment. This is the White Sands Missile Range. This, my experiments is sitting inside of this. This is my collection device. This is balancing my experiment. This is last summer. Uh, we're getting ready to send this up. The person is taking a picture to show that he did a job, his job properly, so that if my experiment explodes, he can say that it wasn't his fault. And I'm watching to make sure he's doing it right, because I always dislike it when my experiments explode. It's a two-stage rocket system. This is the front end, the nose cone, where the sampling actually gets done. You can see that it's closed off with a metal ring at the top, because when this opens, it's done with plastic explosives. And the ring is in case there's an accidental detonation, that it doesn't explode and fly apart when you're standing there. It's a very bad day when that happens. This is what it looks like when it goes. And this is what it looks like when it comes back. So using the samples that we take from this, this is a picture I took from the helicopter, we understand what's happening in that energy balance at the top of the atmosphere because it critically affects us at the ground. And so to understand what those particles are doing, you do need to know what happens in the top of the atmosphere and how we're changing it. And when I say we, I mean the people on the Earth, not the people of La Jolla or wherever. One of the issues that's really critical is if you want to understand a region, 
you need to know what's normal. That, as it turns out, is really difficult. What's normal and what should be there? If you want to understand that, unfortunately, you have to find some place that's very far away from anything. And that, as it turns out, isn't so easy. And so to do that, unfortunately, some of those spots aren't so easy. This is a picture looking at the South Pole, and it shows with time what we've done to ozone and the hole in the Antarctic. Uh, and, and of course, all of you know that Professor Molina was, uh, uh, along with um, Professor Rowland at the UC Irvine, were the ones who cracked um, this issue of the role of fluorocarbons. Well, looking at what happens to oxygen in the atmosphere shows up in ozone, which also shows up in the Antarctic. And what you really would like to know is prior to times when ozone was measured, what happened? And one of the tricks we get out of the isotopes is being able to look at old ozone levels so we can understand what's been normal going back a few hundred years, six months at a time. The problem with doing that is that you need a large sample. This is the ozone hole as shown from a satellite. If you could observe, if your eye was able to see in this part of the spectrum, this is what it would look like from your satellite. This is where you have to go. Center of the screen is where you go. This is the South Pole. It's at approximately 10,000 feet. It's a bad place. Here's what it takes to get there. This is on the coast. This is where it's tropical. You fly here. You land on the ice. Then you get in another airplane after you go through your training and fly over the world's largest glacier, the Bird Glacier, and you land. Here's my equipment sitting on the ice at the South Pole. This is four tons of equipment shipped from my laboratory, which is about 1,000 feet from here, and sitting on the ice. And then one goes. Here's a commercial uh, for the Division of Physical Sciences. Uh, and the little, by the flag in front of it, you see a little pole. That's the South Pole. This is the bottom of the Earth, I mean, from the perspective of people that don't live here who consider it actually not the bottom. Um, and so this is where you go to do your work. In this case, it's three of us. And this is what you see. This is our site. We spent one month here. And this is all you see. Any direction, any time, any place, this is it. And this is in the other direction, in case you thought I was joking. <laughs> and here's what it is. You dig a hole. And you, weigh four, you wear 40 pounds of clothing to dig your hole. And then when it's time to actually take your sample, you have to put on surgical garb because the concentrations of these things that you want to measure in a remote spot are so low that you have to be very clean. So you have to wear all this on top of everything to take your samples. And this is all it is. This is not rocket science. We've seen that part of the show already. And one is taking the sample and going back in time with every three centimeters six months. And you go down 10 meters to the very bottom and take samples by hand and bring them back to La Jolla to measure to understand what happens. In case you're doing the math, it takes about 30 tons of snow removal by hand to do this little project. One of the issues with long range transport that we've been very interested in is in southeastern Ecuador is one of the largest, most pristine, extraordinarily beautiful rainforests in the world. The extinction rate is about one species per hour in this region of the world. There's no change of any note in the local region. And where it shows up, and what got us interested in this, is in fact, and this is a picture of the region, which I show only because I love it down there, um, where it shows up are in plants that make a living by breathing the air. And what's happening is many of these species are disappearing, and it's a measure of air. And it's not the air itself, it's the particles. So this is one of the reasons for going there, is that in the rainforests, which control a lot of the chemistry of our atmosphere, there's major impacts, and a large amount of it is long-range transport from aerosols. So we're continuously sampling in Ecuador time to time sampling in Chile, 
but the real interest is in trying to understand South America and Latin America and combine that with what we're learning in our U.S. studies to understand the planet as a whole. And this is just a travel log. These are the species that I'm talking about. They're air breathing or air living. I'm not a biologist. They're epiphytes. And so that's the issue. And this is in days where it's warmer. If you are ever given a choice of going to the South Pole or the rainforest, go to the rainforest. Here's the last issue I want to mention. This is new. This to me, and, and everyone has their own opinion, in terms of what's going to influence the environment of the coasts of the United States and Central America, it's ships. And I didn't think this was an issue. Paul Crutzen, um, who many of you may know, asked me about this, if we could detect ships using our isotope tricks. He said he thought this was going to big, be a big issue. This is the Atlantic Ocean. All these crisscrosses are ships traveling around um, the Atlantic Ocean. The amount of sulfur and nitrogen aerosols that come as a result of ships is larger than the natural background from all of the oceans. How much is it? How much is it transported? How does it affect the United States coastal region, Latin America, and South America is unknown. This is the Pacific Ocean, and it's not, and you can see that it's cloudy, so you can only see some of the crisscrosses. But here's the last thing I think I'm going to show you. If you look at the yellow, that's the regions where it's influenced, and it doesn't show anything in the southern hemisphere, and that's only because of the models. The models take data that they can get, and then they run it and show the effects. There's no data. And so they haven't been run yet. But for where it's been run, you can see the Western United States and Mexico are very heavily influenced in terms of the emissions from ships. And this is not a US issue. This is not a Mexico issue. This is not a Nicaragua, Salvador, Guatemala, Venezuela, Colombia issue. It's an everybody issue. And so this, to me, in terms of what it means, how it's changing the environment, how it's changing health, how it's changing biology is a huge issue. And we're very much interested in this. And I think it's something that should be studied internationally to understand the local effect. And so as I said, everybody's connected to everybody. This is not a one place, one time. And the way to do it right is to do it internationally. And that's why I've taken your time to tell you these little stories here. And I'm going to stop there and turn it over, I think, to my colleague. Thank you. Do I go? Thanks, Mark. Clearly, a large part of our efforts to conserve the natural capital of our planet, including its atmosphere, are frustrated or totally halted due to diverse and divergent agendas. I would like to begin with what for me is the most sensible and intelligent definition of the word conservation, which is the following. The rational use of natural resources such that the greatest benefits are obtained from nature for current generations, maintaining the potential for future generations to fully satisfy their needs. It's that simple and it's that complicated. This definition indicates the only path to take if we have any kind of hope of lessening our negative and many times destructive impact upon the support systems here on Earth. It is an uncontestable fact that we have only one atmosphere without political, cultural, economic, or geographic distinctions. In this border region, both countries blame each other for generating pollution which affects its neighbor. The New River in Mexicali and the Tijuana River here discharge pollutants into the U.S. Heavy metals from industries in California and the U.S. that pollute the Pacific Ocean along the Baja California coast, hundreds of kilometers in length. In San Diego, Tijuana, we have an interesting case in the Tijuana River where as the 
water basin is found in both countries. The river is composed of various sources which contain a variety of substances from agriculture industry and the urban sector. We know that the activities of all the residents of the watershed influence the water quality in the river and this should motivate us to jointly resolve this problem. This is a small example of how it is possible to create a connection between knowledge and actions. If we are able to mitigate the uh, negative impact upon this binational watershed, we will have moved forward in a replicable fashion. It's an example of consensus building which can serve as a model. The transportation of uh, pollutants to the eastern coast of the U.S. or from there rather to Europe occurs in less than a year. The European pollution reaches Asia in more or less the same time and the Asian uh, pollution is transported to the American continent to close the cycle. It's not them and it's not us. We are all responsible for what we do or what we allow to be done to the detriment of our atmosphere. Truly the power to identify in a scientifically resounding way the pollution is vital and the effort to identify a solution. Three steps are required to resolve any problem. The first is to identify the problem and its sources. The second to develop uh, technological and scientific solutions to resolve the issues. That's the easier part because the third part complicates the equation because it is not dependent upon science or technology. It is dependent upon the desire or goodwill of, the, of humans. The decision to do something, to implement the necessary measures for a solution depends upon the collective desire to do so. The atmospheric pollution is too important a problem to leave it only in the hands of world governments. Currently, our community requires more information, understanding, and technologies which will allow us for a more sustainable biosphere, healthy ecosystems which are economically viable and socially just. It is necessary to close the gap, to build a bridge between science and technology and the institutions and the individuals who will make informed decision and intelligent policy making. You are a key element in uh, forming public opinion. As such, you should provide your reader, your audience with the information that you have to provoke a greater social participation in this third step is the enormous challenge. There are eloquent and defendable positions based on facts which are objective and demonstrate the environmental services which our planet gives us are deteriorating because of our many activities and uh, that in the long term their value is far greater than the economic benefit than we could uh, derive in the short term from these activities. Many times in the area of conservation there are sterile confrontations where different parties uh, blame each other for a variety of activities, uh, hidden agendas, uh, halting economic development without dialoguing, without reaching a, an agreement as to what really is important, which is taking care of the systems which give life to Earth. The consequences of environmental deterioration, unfortunately, in a disproportionate fashion, affect those who are most unprotected and at a social and economic advantage. Societies and individuals who have greater wealth can purchase bottled water or move from deteriorated or polluted areas. But now we have a problem which affects our entire earthly biosphere. Atmospheric pollution is ultimately entirely democratic, placing everything under its mantle at risk. One cannot ex escape. This unifying factor uh, surpasses other issues in environmental problems and because of its magnitude we should sooner or later reflect and act jointly. The atmosphere is the product of processes which have to do with carbon, produce oxygen and renew these constantly. Dis affecting it adversely, destroying or removing the components of these processes which are biodiversity itself uh, cause us to interrupt the functioning w with serious consequences and devastating consequences surely. We run the risk of converting our atmosphere into a non-renewable resource. As I think that we're still in time to resolve this significant issue but time is running out. Thank you very much. And now Dr. Mario Molina.
Muy bien. Buenos días a todos. Good morning, everyone. Voy a, a tratar de hacer I'm un going to try to summarize some of the issues related to the presence of particulates in the atmosphere and as an example I'm going to refer to a field measurement campaign which took place in 2003 in the metropolitan area of Mexico City where we identified several results related to the presence of these particles. I would like to begin by contextualizing this campaign which we undertook. It was part of an integral program of study which we have for large cities, the megalopolises or the mega cities in developing countries. Mexico City is a very clear example of one of these cities. It's one of the most significant challenges environmentally speaking uh, and this has to do with how to clean the atmosphere in Mexico City as you know great many uh, inhabitants 18 or 20 million high density in an area surrounded by mountains which represents an enormous challenge so what we did here in this Mexico City air quality program which is in fact an ambitious program it wasn't merely limited to scientific studies but the idea was to to rather impact how society functions, impact the quality of the air itself. A very important part of this project then has to do not only with the scientific aspect but with studying the economic, social and political aspects. So we've been able to interact closely with the decision makers, with various government agencies and other institutions and of course with people such as yourselves who communicate with the uh, community. We require the support of the citizens who in this case live in uh, Mexico City to bring pressure to bear upon the politicians and change the situation. This in fact has changed. I did not include statistics so as not to exceed my time. but. It, the air quality in Mexico City has improved greatly to the extent that we're concerned that people no longer consider it to be a significant challenge, although it does continue being so. This is a summary of what we did in our first phase. This book, by the way, was just published in Spanish as well. What I wanted to mention about the study is this, that it's really integral and that we're using it as an example because we will be working with other cities in Mexico, Guadalajara, Monterrey, and with the border area with the same methodology, not only the scientific aspect of it to know what is occurring, but also technology. The challenge is no greater than what we face in Mexico City. We have Mexico City, the federal district, the federal government, the PRI, the PAN, and the PRD. Some of you may have heard of these three parties. We need to sit down together to work on this issue. It is a challenge, but it has been done. So I don't think that the challenge is that difficult for us, the U.S. and Mexico, to broach problems at the border. I'm going to focus on one of the impacts of the particles, which has to do with health impacts. We saw how Dr. Mark Thiemens referred to very important global changes, which are also uh, critical. Uh, the problem in Mexico City of vis visibility is, is very clear, but the, the problem which truly concerns us has to do with the impact upon public health and this is a summary of the results of the book which we published in conjunction with uh, colleagues from Harvard University and we see what the effects would be by re in reducing the amount of particulates routinely measured relatively large particulates compared to what Dr. Thiemens mentioned, which are currently being measured as a result of our work and, and the work at, of government agencies in Mexico City. So they're referring to 0.5 uh, micros as well, but routinely the PM10s were, were measured before. But let's say that we reduced 
the amount of particulates by 10%, we would reduce the number of deaths by 3,000 annually in Mexico City. If we were to bring this down even more, that would be proportional. These are people who, what, die uh, due to heart disease because the cardiovascular system is connected to the heart and these diseases are, are heart related. And this is clearly been uh, de demonstrated by statistical studies, not only in Mexico City, but elsewhere. These are deaths that could have been avoided. And many other particular uh, uh, effects, uh, although mortality is the easiest thing to measure. And here, what I'd like to show you, because there are other important effects, there's childhood mortality rates, but there is a study here in California which clearly demonstrates that pollution or particulates affect the uh, lung function in children. Their lungs do not develop as they should when they're exposed to these particulates, something which has been well documented. Where are the particulates coming from? In Mexico City, we see clearly here the transportation sector. But what's interesting here is that although there are a great many vehicles and a lesser number of buses, etc., the contribution of diesel motors is very important. And up until a short while ago, nothing had been thought about controlling these emissions. In Mexico, there's an excellent verification uh, or smug check uh, program um, <clears throat> the but we're barely beginning to work on uh, the issue with the diesel vehicles uh, buses etc which so it's not only the soot which can be observed, but the invisible particulates. All of this affects the lungs, the lung function of children, et cetera. In 2003, and since I don't have time, I'm not going to go into it extensively, we had a campaign with a series of measures, including particulate measurements. If one of you is interested in this, I could obviously provide you with greater detail, but I can't do it here because of uh, time constraints. But I do want to mention, before I forget, that we planned another campaign for next year, 2006. It's called Milagro Miracles. Uh, it's not an official announcement, but this would be in collaboration uh, with U.S. and Mexico. Uh, individuals and has to do with taking planes from the Department of Energy here in the U.S., NASA, and the National Science Foundation through the National Center for Atmospheric Research. As you know, these kinds of activities are expensive. Ten, fifteen million dollars are involved in this kind of campaign. But what's interesting, and I mentioned this to relate this to what Dr. Thiemann said, is that we provide follow-up to this campaign, local results. How to understand more global efforts with the results from the city. It's, in Mexico City, it's good to see what happens to pollution when it leaves, that it may reach the U.S. We will, with these planes, measure what occurs to the particulates, how they uh, mature in the air, and the local and regional effect, very important as well. What did we do in 2003? There was a mobile laboratory and a fixed laboratory uh, with the, all the instruments. And this mobile lab with cutting edge technology is such that the greatest part of the measurements could be made quite quickly, real time. Some of the measurements are particulate. One of the things which can be done with this mobile lab is trace, uh, for example, or a taxi or a bus and see what the vehicle is generating by way of emissions and see as well the whole evolution of pollution. In this case, we use another mass spectrometer which uh, provides a great deal of information regarding particulates, uh, such as what Dr. Thiemann's uh, mentioned in the work of Dr. Kim Prather. But the 
important thing here is the following, without going too much into detail, that with this kind of equipment, which involves uh, mass spectrometry as well, is to be able to measure real time the chemical composition of these particulates um, function of their size. They're separated and one sees what these particulates are made of. Normally this, as Dr. Thiemann mentioned, is done traditionally with filters, so one uh, takes uh, several hours in uh, collecting the per particles. This is done here in seconds, so our information capacity is enormous in terms of real-time activities, and we see that a large number of the particulates are organic. They come from the transportation sector, from burning fuels, and these are the ones that most greatly uh, concern us and their efforts upon public health. These are uh, particles with soot. We see the variation day by day. We have quite a bit of information and specific articles are now being published, but we are ultimately interested in how this affects the regulatory framework. How can we uh, talk with government agencies or other agencies in Mexico to improve the situation? And one of these has to do with changing the emissions from the motors to the diesel. We're not going to speak of this uh, in depth, but we can measure the CO2 levels in the air, if we know the plume of vehicle specifically or not, all of this can be done here. We see how the number of particles goes up very, very clearly when we see an emission plume from a certain vehicle. We also measure individual particles and as uh, Dr. Thiemann mentioned, but by chopping them in, in then examining them with uh, electronic uh, microscopes and the like. Uh, here we see a particle which comes out of a bus and then other uh, components such as sulfuric acid, there's an organic component, an inorganic component. After a while, particles no longer have a clear identity as to being generated by a specific vehicle, but are rather mixed. And we see how some of this changes at the beginning, they repel water, but then when they are oxidized, they absorb water, they change shape, we see their evolution. All of this is quite important to determine its effect upon climate, its effects upon health, and what uh, the results of mitigating the emissions would be in terms of its uh, effect upon the environment. This is one of the better known urban uh, is around the world in Mexico City because of these very detailed uh, studies and a series of other points which I could speak to you of for several hours. This I'm not going to explain to you in great detail, but we measured uh, compounds not only in particles but in the gaseous phase because it turns out that a very significant part of what makes up particles is emitted as gases, but when it reaches the atmosphere, it condenses, so it would appear to be that there is dust in the atmosphere, dust on the floor, which isn't necessarily as bad for your health as organic uh, compounds. All, all the articles there uh, become negative in cities such as Mexico City. These are present to just two-thirds are uh, primary organic compounds, or rather two-thirds are, are secondary organic compounds formed in the atmosphere. A third is emitted directly. There is very little uh, sale metals, but there is significant photochemical activity. To conclude, this was in fact the lesson, is that these results take several years in analyzing we undertook the 2003 campaign, we're about to uh, conclude it, but they have a very real kind of impact upon what we can counsel Mexico, city's government, the federal government, specifically what are the most efficient measures, what do we need to start with, because all of this obviously costs a great deal, but it's even more costly not to take appropriate measurements. We've uh, calculated the cost benefits, but these deaths, this um, 
lung, limited lung development in children if the Mexico City's air is not protected. And we have simplified plans, but in 10 years, Mexico City has clean air. If certain things are met, renew uh, the car fleet, all of which can be done because we have the technological, scientific information basis if, in fact, the government decides to uh, pass the necessary regulation. And this, with this, I think I conclude. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll have all of you go up there, and then you just can call on them. Okay. Part of the issue is trying to understand the role of oxygen in the atmosphere. And that's why the record that we get in the South Pole gives us a, a relationship between what's happened in the past to what might happen in the future. And in this case, the South Pole is useful because it's remote from everything. So it's really looking at the picture of what's happening everywhere. You need the record over time and the ice is the only way to get it. And so trying to understand what's happened globally, whether it's Uruguay or San Diego or London, um, this is one way to do it. Now there are features, of course, of the South Pole and the Antarctic that are special. The vortex and the role of fluorocarbons is special for there. But subtracting that out, you can understand the role of the other agents and how they affect the climate of the entire planet by going to these regions. And that's why it's relevant for Uruguay, for example. Maybe I can. Puedo agregar algo muy brevemente para complementar la respuesta. I'd like to follow up on that answer. There are very direct effects in southern cities, such as Punta Arenas, because sometimes the ozone hole comes closer and more UV light penetrates than otherwise would. The important thing is that the, the southern pole or the south pole is an extreme case. If CFCs had continued as it was, there would have been terrible problems in the northern and southern latitudes. And as the ozone layer went down spectacularly in the South Pole. This is the problem that we're trying to resolve, although fortunately there are very few people living there. <laughs> Maybe Mark, just Mark at the South Pole. But this is symbolic of how we can affect the entire planet and how we can calculate uh, the significant portion of the population exposed to UV light with potential cancer effects, etc. But this this particular problem is being worked on. Uh, the Brevemente, aquí, aquí lo que pasa es que se Here what estas, happens uh, is that <coughs> these monitoring networks provide important statistics to determine how the pollution improves or worsens in the long term to see if government uh, initiatives are successful or not, but we must recognize that these uh, standards, health standards, are arbitrary. We know that there are peaks which can be quite uh, hazardous and the community would have to be alerted if this occurred for uh, several hours. This is arbitrary as to what the various government agencies decide to do, but the idea is to mitigate pollution as a whole. There's a great deal of experience here in the U.S. Policy making is discussed greatly, but in scientific circles, even though the regulation may be approved, the problem has not been resolved. So this is more, I think, a question that requires greater dialogue between the government authorities and the epidemiologists, researchers, and physicians. One cannot become mired in an arbitrary measure, but it's practical in nature, temporary. Just, follow, just one other question, point. Um, Chile is especially interesting because it's so dry. And so in the formation of particles, it's been a particularly interesting area to study because of the extreme dryness through the Atacama 
and how particles get transported. And for that reason, we've spent a lot of time studying it because there's really no other place in the world like it except in the Antarctic Dry Valleys. The second part that's a consequence of that is that it's led to the buildup of the enormous nitrate deposits, which is a, a large part of the economy, is the mining and, and processing of nitrate. And that's also a major issue in Chile that you really don't have anywhere else in the whole world. So as Professor Molina has said, that's why monitoring and diagnosis is critical uh, place by place. And Chile is very unusual in this way. I'm not very well informed of the local situation, but I'm in touch with the investigative group, especially at the government level in both countries. And we are about to start a very ambitious program to use the same methodology that we're using in Mexico City to do it here in the frontier on the border region. There are talks, there are groups, but they have not had the success that we wish. That's why we want to participate, so that we can talk with decision makers at the government level that could implement changes. So we need more measurements, more facts. It's not totally necessary. We can start with the measurements we have now. There are commissions, binational commissions, in this area as well as in Mexicali or in Feria Valley. And this is something that we hope to start with the support of UCSD so that we can take on this subject and have the, an important impact in the air quality in these areas. An additional point, an example. Uh, this, with this agreement, this commercial agreements, the borders are going to open even more. And there's the danger that uh, there will be a importation of a lot more trucks and automobiles that are not up to speed, that pollute tremendously. So we need to take measures, not with the free trade agreements, but uh, with norms that if these cars are going to be imported, they must pass muster with environmental laws or regulations because we don't want to uh, inherit vehicles that are not usable in the U.S., but they can be used in Mexico. So these are the types of issues that uh, we need to tackle so that that importation of those types of vehicles are uh, very regulated. The upper atmosphere work is, is a whole air sample not particle, particles. So it's to look at the gases and the changes in the gases that affect the chemistry at the ground level. So that upper atmospheric part, which is a collection of whole air by freezing in whole samples, does not look at the particles at ground level. At ground level, it's a different sort of collection process and it's dedicated to looking exactly at the particles and what they are and where they come from. So I don't know if that answers your question, but they're a little bit different. Is it two different things altogether? No. The gases that are influenced in the upper atmosphere, especially ozone, are responsible for making the particles. So for example, in the case of nitrogen, uh, which is an issue in, in Chile, um, it gets converted or made into a particle by ozone. And so how those level changes in ozone, which is also observed in the top of the atmosphere, influences how they get made. If they get made slowly, for example, the particles get removed closer to where they're made, or, or fast. If they get made slowly, then they get transported long distances. So they can be very tightly related, and that's why you need to know both. And, and how a whole region might be affected. Responded? Yeah. 
si quiere agregar muy brevemente lo que pasa. If you want, I can add something very briefly because there's a lot of questions. You still, you have to identify different types of problems. They're all interrelated, but yes, you have to differentiate. There's local problems in cities that are contaminated, and that's where you have to measure right there. There's a global climate change problem at the, at the global level, and we have to measure through the entire planet. And there's interconnections, important interconnections. And then there's regional problems. Conditions, if climate changes, then the atmosphere chemistry is going to change, and, and temperature is going to change, and that's going to affect contamination at the urban level. And for example, in Mexico City, contaminants, they leave Mexico City and they could affect other regions. It's all interrelated. So we have to have that vision as a whole of different types of problems. Some are local, some are regional, some are global.